Well, good morning. I am blessed to be here, and I realize that as I've been teaching this week that English is sometimes difficult for people, so I try to slow down. If I get going too fast as we're spending this time together, if you, as, as you feel the spirit move, your hands are up, and uh, I'm going too fast, just kind of wave them, and that's the slow down as well. You can worship and tell me to slow down, same time. <laughs> so uh, I just thank you for uh, allowing me this morning. It's, it's always interesting as I come into different churches, the different experiences and uh, just not knowing kind of what's, what to expect. And so I just ask that you would give me the grace this morning to be myself. The grace, uh, that's my, why I have to ask that of my wife all the time. Uh, and I've asked my wife for extra grace because today, this day, is our 18th wedding And I am with you and not her. So I had to have extra grace as I went on this trip. But uh, a little bit about me. I did not grow up in a religious home. I did not grow up going to church. And so I, I never was an atheist, but as I came to God, it really happened through uh, really about starting my middle school years, I began reading the Bible because I just thought it was a good idea. I just thought maybe from kind of what I've heard and experienced, maybe I should pray. Maybe I should read my Bible. And I ended up reading the, I just started in Matthew and read all the way through the New Testament. And I remember reading things like, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. And I said, I'm not going to do that. That's not what Jesus meant, but I was still in rebellion to it. Not going to do it. And I also read in James where it says, faith without works is dead. And I said, I don't want to give up my fun. I believe in God, but I don't want to give up my fun. And I very clearly remember that. So after finishing the New Testament, I go and I start at the beginning, Genesis, and I'm going to read through the Old Testament. And like most people, I get hung up around middle of Exodus and Leviticus. So I abandon that. I go to the Psalms and Proverbs, and I finish those, and I say, what am I going to do now? I go back, and I begin reading through the New Testament again, chapter by chapter, one chapter every night. Read through the entire New Testament again. It didn't change. Still said, faith without works is dead. What I knew is that I had not put my faith in Christ. I, I knew the information. I believed God was real. I believed Jesus died for my sins. I had never put my faith. And after reading through the New Testament twice, it was the middle of my eighth grade year of school. So I'm about 13, 14 years old. And I know that if the God that I have read about is real and true, and this word, he's really what he says in this book, then I either have to be all in or walk away because he does not give us middle, a middle road. And that was my prayer that night because I didn't know what else to say. I said, God, I'm all in. I don't know what that looks like, but I'm all in. And what I had read is that you're supposed to be baptized afterwards. So I, my grandmother went to church, so I called up my grandmother and I said, uh, you know, I need to be, I need to be baptized. You know, I am faith in Christ. And so she came, took me to church and I during, uh, during the services, uh, at the end, they had a time of response. I went down to the pastor, and I said, I need to be, because that's what people did. I just went down to the pastor who was standing there. He greeted me. I said, I need to be baptized. He says, well, let me, let me lead you through the sinner's prayer. And I said, I already done that. I said, I did that actually in my room. I said, I, I've put my faith in Christ. He's like, well, you know, you need to receive Christ. I said, I already have. Like, we, I was like, is this not normal? <laughs> you know, I was like, I, I just need to be baptized. I'm following in obedience. So my, my real intro into church was they didn't know what to do with me because it wasn't the usual experience. And what I found as I went into church is that what I had read about did not match what was in front of me. And as I began to grow in Christ, I knew that I needed to be a disciple. And I'd read what that looked like in scripture. I'd seen it and I said, okay, I, I need to be discipled. And I go to church and for my experience, that didn't happen. And I ended up switching churches uh, eventually, and uh, I found a youth pastor that kind of poured into me, and uh, he was part-time, didn't have a lot of time, so what he would do is he would use teenagers to teach on a Wednesday night sometimes, just let us share, so he opened up, he said, who would like to teach, and now I'm about in 10th grade, and I said, I'll, I'll take a stab at it, and he began, I would say, accidentally mentoring me, and what happened is I, as I grew when he left, 
the, the Christmas of my senior year of high school, the church actually asked me to become acting youth director because I was the only one in the church who had been teaching in the youth and who understood how to run it, and I was 17 years old. Now, it was interesting that I was asked to do this, and it was my, as I say, baptism by fire, as now I'm running everything. I can't even drive the church van. I just ride with the guy who, rides, who runs the church van to go pick up people because I knew where they all lived. And uh, as we did this, I, I realized later on in the entire church, the only one qualified, at, really if you would say that, to teach the youth was a youth himself. So as I went off to college, Again, I try to grow in the Lord, look for the mentors, look for the discipleship, and I didn't find it. So that's why this morning, as I come talking about cultivating good soil, and we talk about it's really how to make disciples and conversational discipleship, this is a message that's near and dear to my heart. This is a message that I believe that if, and I've, I've, I've often said, if I could take this message to the world, I would do so. And here I am, 8,000 miles from my home getting to share what I believe is the, the culmination of where God has been moving me and why, as I, as I come before you today, I am an interim pastor at my church in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, our church was established in 1756, a very old church with a lot of new believers. And so I, I, I'm an interim pastor. I'm also a professor of apologetics which is defending the faith. What I do is I teach believers how to give an answer, how to give a reason. Why do you believe what you believe? As I, when, it, when I served really in, since 1997, I had served in the pastoral ministry to some degree, and as I look at churches, I ask them, why are you a believer? And many times believers would look at me and I said, that's just because that's, that's how I was raised. And I said, I would, I would remind them, Jesus Christ is Lord regardless of how you were raised. We need, a, we need a better answer. So what I do is I try to teach pastors at the Bible College how to share this truth. I teach it at my church. And that's uh, really when I, when I tell people the, what I really am now, as I said, what, if, whether it's pastor, professor, whatever, whatever title you want to give me, the title that I think carries the most weight is that I try to be a disciple because that's the title I take with great fear and trembling, because I don't always do so well. <laughs> maybe you do better than I do, maybe, maybe but I, I just feel like this is something we're all called to be, but to be a disciple, there's no, there's no greater calling. Everything fits under that. And in my life, and where God has brought me, and partly why I'm here in South Africa, is God gave me a vision, and I tell people what I really am is I'm a missionary to the church. I believe, and the, the church in America is in decline. I don't know how much you know about the, the church in America, but it's in pretty bad shape right now. And there's a lot of people who want to abandon it and just start over. And I said, I don't believe it's a lost, lost cause because Jesus himself said, hell itself will not overcome it. And I said, I believe there's a lot of believers out there who were like me, who want to know, who want to grow, and they look around and they're saying, almost like the eunuch uh, when he was reading Isaiah and Philip went to him and the eunuch said, how will I understand unless somebody shows me? I believe there's people out there. And I, I said, my best way to put it is uh, I hunt them. I hunt them in the Lord. I want to know where they are. I want to help them. Because I believe that if we can make disciple makers, we can change the culture. You can change a nation. You can change the world. You don't change it through legislation. We're not going to change it by the external rules, that we have to change the people from the inside. Because anybody can act right for a little while. I think most, most of us know that. My, I told my wife I promised I would behave while I was here. I know how to act right. But sometimes in our heart, we are mischievous, and sometimes in our heart, we are dark. We've got to make disciple makers. And so that's really what I wanted to bring this morning. As, as we begin, do we have the slides up? And this is a little different from maybe what you're used to. And again, I don't know what you're used to. I have no idea. So I'm just going to be me. I'm just going to do this as, I was, as I've prepared. That I have a message 
that I have to get out. I have a message that I need to share. And that's really what I want to bring this morning. So if I'm a little different, if I'm not what you're used to, forgive me, I'm American. That's been my excuse all week. It's going to be my excuse for the next two weeks. Uh, we actually took pictures at um, some place I can't pronounce uh, that we went to the other day. And we had all these little signs with all these sayings in Afrikaans. And mine was upside down. And uh, one of the students made mention of that, like, You're, it's upside down. I was like, I'm, you know, it fits. I'm an American. I have no idea what I'm doing. So I just held it just like that. Because I think that kind of, uh, my, my world is upside down. And uh, so I'm just going to, to share with you what God has laid on my heart that I seek to share with the nations. That I believe if we could understand this, if we can grab hold of this, then what that will do is, is, as the way God works with us, is that as we learn, as we grow, as we take on the mind of Christ, it penetrates into our heart. And that when our heads and hearts are aligned, and we know what, and we have that passion, we become the people who do. If we just have the passion, you don't know what to do. You're like my, my I have three boys. I have an, an eight-year-old, a four-year-old, and almost a two-year-old. And my eight-year-old, he can be so passionate. And he gets in there, and he, and he just goes for it, and he typically breaks whatever he's trying to put together or do. He just gets so excited because he lacks the knowledge. And so many times in my ministry, I've seen people who knew everything they needed to know, but they didn't have the hearts that cared. And I think that's the mistake we've made. I've seen it the last 20 years as I've ministered. Hearts and heads that aren't aligned, and that's why the church has faltered, and that's why so many, and even in my years, I spent 15 years a youth pastor, and I trained and mentored students, and I watched them walk away. Then in the States, the millennial generation, we lose about 80%, and I thought if I could just tell them, if I could just give them solid truth, we could keep more, and my numbers weren't any better. And I looked at it, I was like, what is going on? And I realized I had taught them all things, but they had hearts that did not care. So if we're going to cultivate good soil, we got to cultivate the whole thing. We need to be like the men of Issachar. Men of Issachar, that's one of the tribes of Israel. That tells us in First Chronicles, they had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And I look at the church and everywhere I go, I tell them, do you understand where we are? Have you stopped and taken a look? Because the world seems to be losing its mind at a, at a very fast pace. That uh, there's things going on in the States right now that I, I've been following with social media. And uh, I told John, you know, we, we, you know he, keeps, he keeps asking. He's like, have we shown you enough that you'll come back? I said, I'll come back for the meat alone. You guys eat wonderfully. <laughs> That's just enough. But uh, with the things going on in the States, I said, you know, I, I'd love to bring my family over. But with the way things are going right now, my wife might be asking for a new place to live. The way... And sanity is ruling the day in the world right now. That in, uh, in China, I served in China twice with the underground church. They, have underground, they used to have underground Bible colleges. They would meet at uh, apartments. It was the only way you could get training in China, as professional training as a minister. They would train about 100 people a year for, I, f I forget how many, hundreds of millions of Christians. That was the only trained pastors, the only trained ministers in China, about 100 that's all they had room for. And I would go in, and, and I, I know the faces. I know the names of the people who are in prison right now, who are hunted by the government, and who are in jail. They're my friends. They were my students. But the Chinese government has put bounties on Christians. Do we understand the times we live in? Do we understand the culture? Do we understand our churches and where our churches are? We need to be the kind of people who looks and really sees, not just, and not just lament, but do we have the hearts and the courage to, to stand strong, move forward? And do we believe that Jesus Christ still reigns? Do we believe that Jesus can still turn that church around or have we just given over? I ask churches this many times and there's some people who, who say, I don't know. How do, we, how do we turn this around? And I always remind them, you don't. But through the Holy, the Holy Spirit through you can accomplish so much more. But we, what we like to do is we like to put up some barriers. We put up some limitations. We say, Jesus, work through me on my terms. He doesn't always want to do that. If we look around the times we live, if we, we, live, uh, if we understand the times we live, we're going to repackage our approach in evangelism and discipleship to include something else. 
This is what I've been teaching. I just taught this a week for the last week at the Bible College. I'm going to be teaching. Kind of what I'm, I'm sharing today is what I'm going to be unpacking and expanding at the Bible College this week. This idea of we've been doing evangelism and discipleship kind of the same way for a long time. At least in the States, I know it's that way. There's just kind of this way churches do it. And I often come from churches who believe that because that's the way we've done it, that's the way we should keep doing it forever and ever and ever. Because it was good enough for great-great-grandma, it was good enough for great-grandma, it was good enough for grandma, it was good enough for mom, it's good enough for me, and we don't live in that world anymore. That I would even say, it has happened that as I teach at my Bible college in Fayetteville, that sometimes when I'll teach a course from year to year, that there have been some courses where I have, I have taught and I've looked and I said, this is where we're going. This is what's going to happen. And as I just finished, we just finished the, the term at my Bible college, and this last term, I've looked at my students and I said, used to, this is where we're going. Now I tell you, this is where we've already been, and here's what's coming next. That even from year to year, things are changing so rapidly that the, the old methods, I, I tell people, the old methods are good. The old methods of evangelism that many people are trained, you know, okay, we're going to give a good gospel presentation. I'm not, and I tell people, don't stop doing that, but we need to add something to it because we live in a world today where people don't know what that means. People don't know what the gospel is. And I say that, and I, and I reference this to the church. I served three and a half years as a senior pastor of a church. Every time I would go to visit someone, every time I would go in, I would ask people, what is the gospel? I would get around to that. I wouldn't lead with that. You know, I start with, hi, how are you? Nice family. I love the wall. I love, you know, all the pictures and talk about the health, talk about the weather. Everybody has to talk about the weather. And we get around, where is your relationship with Christ? And they'd been church. They had been grown up in church 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Some people have been church members longer than I've been alive. And I realized as we have this conversation, I would always get around and I was like, I just want to hear from you. What is the gospel? And in three and a half years, not one Christian adult could in a sentence clearly tell me what the gospel was. Now, I'm from the south of the United States, the southern part. That Bible belt, if you're familiar with it, that's where I'm, I actually live. I've lived in the buckle of the Bible belt, as we say. That's kind of like the Grand Central Station. You know, it just seems like Christianity just flows. But even in the Bible belt... People who had been Christians for so long didn't know what that meant. How do we miss that? How can it be that when uh, we were doing the Lord's Supper, when we were doing communion, that I preached on communion and I had an elderly gentleman in his 60s come up to me who'd been at that church his whole life tell me, until now, I had no idea why we did this. 60 years in that church and no idea. So we're living in a world that does not understand what the gospel is. They're not, we don't have this, this Christian culture. And I believe it's very similar in South Africa. I've been trying to learn the culture. I'm trying to learn some of the words, uh, maybe some of the, the words. I don't know how the way you pronounce it. I'm like learning some. I love like the Afrikaans, uh, the names. You know, I get to roll my R's like I have a student, Ruan. And I'm like, I don't get to do that in the States. It's so much fun. So I realized in, my, in coming into this culture, I've got to add a few things. I've got to adapt because that's the way things are. The church has to do that as well, that if we're, the church is going to be the church and affect the culture, we've got to add a few things into our evangelism, into our discipleship. And so the, the, the way that I've kind of tried to change the church is try to, try to say it this way, and I loved it because last Sunday... I was, I was at uh, the other campus, and when I heard them talking about making disciple makers, it made my heart just leap for joy because I say that in the States, and it's like, whoa, I've never heard that before. I've never thought about that before. We all just want to make, we want to make disciples, and we have in the States disciple making conferences where we just want to make disciples, and I, I go to these things, and I, I see all these hundreds of pastors, and it's all about make disciples, make disciples. And I'm like, it's about making disciple makers. We're missing it. We're, we're missing the goal. We're just off mark. And to hear that when I was here in South Africa, I, mean, I cannot relate to you how joyful I was just even getting the terms right. That's a start. Using the language the right way, that's a start. If discipleship is becoming like Jesus, 
then what I share with you is that conversational discipleship is performing a soil sample on their minds and hearts to diagnose and remove the barriers of Christ's likeness. Now, this is a mouthful, but this is what we're going to be dealing with, and this is what I want to get out, is that in my ministry, I realized I would share these truths. I would share the theology. I would share the scriptures, and I realized that they were not hearing what I was saying, that even at the church I was called to as a pastor, I told them, I'm a disciple-making pastor. That has defined my ministry. And around the room, the deacons said, oh, yes, yes, that's what we want. Six months into it, one of the deacons said, Pastor, you need to stop preaching on discipleship because the lost don't care about being disciples. And I said, we have, we have disconnected somehow. We have, I realized we were using the same terms, different dictionary. We need in our churches more of a diagnostic discipleship to know where people are coming from because the world likes to influence the church. We absorb things from the world. You watch the TV, you, observe, you absorb some of those ideas. Your kids, when they go into school, they come home, your grandkids, they say these things, and you ask, where did you get that from? We need to diagnose where our church members are. We need to diagnose where we are. So this means we've got to change the soil. Our job is to help people cultivate good soil. This, is, this happens so the gospel can be fruitful in lives. And this is what I'm seeing across churches. And this is why my message today is for the church. My message today is for believers that sometimes we, we come and we do church, but anybody can do church. And I say that because at one of the churches I served at where I was a youth pastor, we had a gentleman who was part of the church, and he was an atheist. And you're like, how does that work? Whole time I was there, I was there seven years. He was an atheist there almost every Sunday morning. You know, that doesn't fit. His granddaughter loves the church. His wife loves the church. And he came regularly. I taught his Sunday school for a year. Like, he was in there, and he would ask me the questions. He would would ask me these things. And so uh, what I knew is that the gospel had, had borne no fruit in his life and could not until he received Christ. That's the evangelism. But so many disciples, what I was watching is they were about as fruitful as he was. And the gospel was not bearing fruit in their lives. And that's why we have to diagnose, why is this happening? What's going on? And so often in our churches, we don't ask those questions. We don't ask those questions about our lives. And so that's why as I I travel, I try to call the church like, are we really being like Jesus? Because it's very easy to say, oh, yes. And what do we do? I go to church. I go to Bible study. I have prayer time. We start naming all these things we do. And I asked my church one time, what difference does Jesus Christ make in your life? And how are you different with him in your life than you were if he wasn't in your life? Because anybody can do those things. How has Jesus made that internal change? How is fruit manifesting from your life? Are we just adding on activities Or are we coming from a life that's been changed? And people tell me that they've never thought about it that way. And I said, most likely, if we've not thought about it that way, then what we've done is is we've we've added on all these things, and then we think that, that we're being disciples. But I tell you, anyone can act right, as we say in the States. Anybody can do good. Any atheist can. Any Buddhist can. But the difference with the Christian is that it's not just something we add on. It's not just something we do. It's something that comes from within. And that's no small difference. There's there's no small difference behind, in the case of my son, my eight-year-old, when he cleans his room. Or as my wife, I often use this example, when my wife wants me to wash dishes. I don't like dishes. That's not my spiritual gift. I don't like it. So I would help my wife with the dishes, and I'm like, well, I've done my husbandly duty, and she's still, she's mad at me. Like, I did the dishes. She says, yes, but I want you to want to do the dishes. That's just asking too much. I want to, who wants to do dishes? Like, who, who, who thinks about that? Like, ooh, I want to do dishes. I don't get it. But what happened was, as I was working with my wife, I understood a little bit, so... What happened is, I want to love and serve my wife. And out of that desire, 
in my desire for service, I know that by helping her with the dishes, that is an act of love. That is, that is something that she appreciates. That is something that just makes her so happy. It's not about the dishes. It's about that relationship. And so I will come and I'll say, can I help you with the dishes? And she said, you don't want to help me with the dishes. I said, I want to serve you and show you love. So if by doing the dishes, that's how it must be, then I want to do the dishes in that way. Is that good enough? And she's like, yes. <laughs> the manifestation from within. Are we the kind of soil that it's not about, it's not even about when we feed the homeless or we give and we're generous because anybody can do that. There's plenty of atheistic organizations that do that. But when it comes from within as an act of service to Christ, that is entirely different. We serve as an act of love for our Savior, whatever that looks like. So what does the diagnostic discipleship look like? And this comes out of David Geisler is the one, and his, his dad, Norman Geisler, wrote this book on conversational evangelism. And when I first found this uh, several years ago, I took a course from David Geisler, I read this, and immediately as a pastor, my heart said, this isn't just evangelism, this is discipleship as well. We need this in the church. So to briefly show you what it looks like, and we play four roles, that there's four roles, and so this gets really easy because in the life of, a, of an evangelist and in the life of a discipler, there's four things we have to do. The first is we play the role of the musician. We hear sour notes. That in your Sunday school classes, in your cell groups, I was watching all the Afrikaans up on the, the board and I was puzzling some of those things out. Like, I'm, I'm not going to attempt it, but I can see, oh, you have cell groups. I got it. I, I can see those words. I was like, I, I'm, I'm making those connections. In your family, as you seek to disciple your family, because parents, you are the disciplers in your family. If everybody says, sometimes people say, I'm not called to discipleship. I'm not called... I said, if you got a family, I said, even if you just have a spouse, you have a calling, you have a ministry, at least there, in your own families. I listen to my, stu I listen to my, my sons. I listen to what they say. I listen to my wife. I listen at my church. I want to hear these things, and I hear what we call sour notes, the, the things that don't match, the contradictions, the, like, where did you hear that? You really think that? So I'm I'm listening so that I can really hear what's going on. Because I like to think that my boys are just, just great guys. And I just like to, you know, because every parent, you know, we like to think, oh, they've got it. And sometimes I hear and what they say and I'm like, they, they, don't, they don't have it. Sometimes I listen to myself and I realize I don't have it. I have to play the role of musician. Hear the sour notes. Just like with my son, my, my eight-year-old, he, he plays guitar. He's learning, let me say this, he's learning to play guitar. I believe there's a difference between playing guitar and learning to play guitar. He is learning to play guitar. And so the book that he's using uses various songs like from the Beatles and from Elvis and just some simple chords and things, and he plays them. And where we live in my house, we have, uh, we have his playroom and kind of like a schoolroom, and my office is right there. So he's about five, ten feet from me playing, practicing, difference, practicing his guitar. And as he's playing, I don't know music. My wife plays piano. My sons are learning music. I have three brothers who were all in band. My, my mom played piano. And I tell people, you know, if, if you've seen the movie, like, A Wonderful Life, whenever the, a bell rings, an angel gets his wings, when I sing, God takes them away. So I don't have musical ability. But I can hear sour notes. Though I cannot play, I can hear when my son is playing sour notes on his guitar, what I lack is the ability to show him how to do it correctly. I think that's where we are in the church many times. We hear the sour notes of our churches. We hear the sour notes of our communities. But we don't know how to correct it. The second role is the role of the artist. This is where you illuminate, you paint the picture. And this is where I spend time trying to, trying to show people what they believe. And like, okay, you say this. I, this happened when I was in college. There was a, 
a, a student who was a Mormon, and I was working a desk in a dorm. She came through, and we were chatting, and I said, let me get this straight. And this is before I even understood conversational evangelism. It's, it's built on how we interact as people. And I said, let me get this straight. If I play my cards right, if I behave, do good, I get to become God and have my own planet. And she says, well, when you say it that way, it sounds kind of weird. I was like, it's not how I said it. <laughs> but that's what Mormonism teaches. So we illuminate, we paint the picture. You, is this really what you're saying? And sometimes when people hear the thoughts outside of their own heads, they all of a sudden realize it doesn't sound as good when you say it. That happens to me all the time when I'm talking to my wife because something goes through my head and comes out my mouth and I'm like, it sounded a lot better in my head and I really wish it stayed there. Amen? God, I see guys, yep, yep, I know, I get it. Same thing happens with our beliefs. That's something we need to paint a picture. Do you understand this is what you're saying? And then we play the role of the archaeologist. We want to uncover what are their genuine barriers to Christ. Now, having had some of this training when I was a pastor and I was preaching at a funeral, and I gave a gospel presentation, as I often do when it comes to the funerals. Afterwards, we were having a meal with the family, and a man comes up to me, and I was, this is the meal with the family, and I'm just, I'm hanging out, I don't know them very well, and there was these little, these little trays, and they have these little miniature cupcakes, and they're really hard to get out of this tray, so I'm kind of like knuckle deep inside a cupcake trying to get this thing out, and this guy comes up to me, he gets right here in my face, and he says, I'm from Pakistan, I'm a former Muslim, I fell out of Islam, but I've not gone into Christianity, am I going to hell or what? Now again, I'm, like, I'm knuckle deep in a cupcake. I said, okay. The role of the archaeologist. You say you've come out of Islam, but you've not gone into Christianity. What is your biggest barrier to Christianity? He says, I do not understand how God can copulate with a woman and produce a son. I said, oh, good, we don't believe that either. He said, what? <laughs> said, we don't believe that. That's not what the incarnation is. What is it? And I'm like, okay, hold on. You know, I got all this chocolate, so what am I going to do? Um, I draw on the wall with <laughs> my, my chocolate. Like, this is what the Trinity is, and this is how the incarnation works. He's like, oh, I've never heard such things. You got to figure out what the biggest barrier is to the gospel when it comes to evangelism. When it comes to the spirit-filled life, when it comes to spiritual growth, when it comes to discipleship, there are barriers. There are things that hold us back. And we need to figure out what those are. And in the lives of those we minister to, we need to figure out what are those things that are holding them back. And the last role is the role of the builder. That in the case of discipleship, we want to build from where they are to a life that looks like Christ. It's the sanctification process. How are we going to get them there? That so often in churches, what happens when someone comes to Christ we're like, all right, take a seat. And we just hope they happen to absorb Christianity somewhere along the way. I experienced it myself in church. I've watched it happen in church. And I look at this and, and I'm saying, this is, not, this is not what church is supposed to be. That we, we, We're discipling by accident. We're just putting people together and just hoping something catches. We need to be a bit more intentional. Jesus was very intentional. And the way he poured into his disciples and the way that he ministered, where he went, all of these things. And, and he used whatever tools he had to show people and to grow them. And that's what we need to do where, where people are, starting where they are. How can we build bridges to a life that looks like Christ? How do we help them take off the old and put on the new? See, my, my almost two-year-old, his name's Ezra. Ezra cannot dress himself. That if I take Ezra and I say, all right, it's time to go, get your shirt on, you know, and he's just kind of kind of look at me and just go, <clears throat> he doesn't really, <clears throat> he doesn't have language so much. He's, he's got a few words. He can say, mama, dada, no. Uh, he's, got, he's got a few key words. He can't do it. He doesn't have that ability. My four-year-old, or my four-year-old, he can pretty much dress himself, but the one his, his one weakness, his one barrier, is the shirt. 
My, my oldest son is tall and lanky. He's built like my in-laws. My, my father-in-law was about 6'4", somewhere in the 6'5". Uh, my, my oldest is like, built like him. My, my middle child, my four-year-old, he's what I call McCuddy build. Good Scots-Irish stock. Bulky. It's just like his daddy. Big head. He can't get his shirt over his head half the time. He can't do it. I know that if I can handle the shirt, he can take care of the rest. We've got to meet people where they are. So often what we do is we throw the clothing of Christ at them and we say, go for it. And that's not how discipleship works. My oldest, my eight-year-old, he's perfectly capable. He's been taught. He's learned. He knows how to do it. What my eight-year-old has a problem is the same problem as daddy has. He doesn't know how to match things. I kid you not, when I was in the Philippines, took a picture while I was at the, the Mall of Asia, biggest mall in the world. I say, look, look, here at this amazing mall. My wife said, this is terrible. And I said, what? She says, your outfit. What's wrong with my outfit? The colors match. She said, my love, plaid shorts, striped shirt. But the colors match. I don't get it. What's wrong? Some of you ladies are looking at me like, seriously? I got the pictures to prove it. I don't know. I still have that problem. My kids get dressed. And I'm like, they're like, daddy, is this okay? Does it fit? Yeah, okay, go ask your mom. <laughs> I lack that ability. We do that same thing in the church where a lot of believers have put on a lot of things and they don't fit and they don't match. We need a kind of discipleship that can teach people how to do that, how to put on the image of Christ to take off, to identify what is the old, to take that off, to identify what is the new, what is the Christ-like life, and to put that on. So the biblical basis for doing diagnostic discipleship comes from Matthew 13. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 13. This is often called the parable of the sower, but this is also, in a way, the focus for us today is the parable of the soils. Speaks to us in terms of evangelism, but it also speaks very much in terms of discipleship. That in Matthew 13, what we have, Jesus, this begins the parable chapters, uh, the chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, starting verse 3, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and, when they, had no, and they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. I've heard many different interpretations, many different concepts, and the fun thing is, this is one of the parables Jesus tells us what it means. He lets us know exactly what's going on. He tells us the interpretation that there are four types of soil, and this represents the kind of things that we will see, the kinds of responses to the gospel. And this morning, as we read this, this these are the kinds of responses I see in the church, that there are some who have the hard soil. They don't understand. The rocky soil, fearful. The word in the Greek that it says when they fall away, they were scandalized. It's where we get our English word, scandalize. They were scandalized by the gospel. The thorny soil, the cares of the world, the mortgages, the cars, the medical bills, the career. The cares of the world choke the word. But then there's also good soil. And I think that anything we see in our churches today, we recognize all the issues, they can pretty much fit into one of these categories at least. Every single issue we have, every single thing can be traced back to one of these issues. So Jesus tells us that a person's receptivity to God's word and its resultant fruit is determined by the condition of the heart. That the heart is going to determine that as we hear the word, how do we respond? That when we, again, when we, when we worship, when we hear the truth of God, does our heart leap or are we like, meh? See, the condition of my heart, when I first got married 18 years ago, I had no idea what it meant to be married. Okay? 
I'm going to be honest. Most of you guys, you probably didn't either. Okay? So I'm not the only one. Don't look at me that way. So I did not know how to be married. I had no idea. I had no godly examples of what it meant to be a godly husband. I, I didn't know. So I was very bad at it. And my heart was still clinging to other things. And my wife was very patient. I still don't know why she, she tolerated me the way she did, but we got through those dark years and they were my fault. And so eventually what happened over time is I began to develop a heart for my wife and then when my kids came along, I had a heart for my kids. And so even now being here in South Africa, I always like to video chat with her. I love having like the Skype and being able to see their faces. And for my wife, who used to say, you know, hey, you need to pay attention to me. Now she's just like, you're smothering me. What's going on? I was like, my heart has changed. She's like, took you long enough. <laughs> Slow learner. But 18 years later, my heart, I just, it, it just does my heart such good to see my family and have that. The condition of my heart has been changed. And it took a long time to make that happen. In our churches, I would say that we have, we have bad soil. And, you, and I, as I tell people to mix my metaphors, you cannot microwave discipleship. I think in our churches, we try to. Six weeks, eight weeks, let's do a study and press the button start. Six to eight weeks later, oh, look, we have a new and improved Christian. And I just, don't think, I just don't think that's the case. I know that's not the case in my own life. It took a lot of time to change the condition of my heart, to bear the right kind of fruit. So again, the sower, as Jesus tells us, he's the one who sows the word. The seeds symbolize the word of the kingdom. And the four soils represent those different conditions of the heart. This is, what, this is what's going on. I believe it's the case with evangelism. I believe it's the case with discipleship. That in our churches, I ask and I look around, I said, the, the greatest mistake I ever made is when I stood in front of a group and I thought that we were all good soil. Because at the very least, if everybody in the room had their act together, this guy on stage doesn't always have his act together. And by not always, I mean I pretty much don't. I know we think that, well, pastors are supposed to have their act together, correct? Like when you serve in a church, you're supposed to have your act together. But we are fallen, broken human beings. And we often have bad soil. We may not have as much bad soil as we had yesterday, but we are still a work in progress. Every single one of us. Jesus specifically helps us understand what conditions make it difficult for the word to bear that spiritual fruit for God's kingdom. And what keeps it is the stubborn response, the hard. And again, Jesus says, these are the ones who hear and do not understand. And as a pastor, I've learned that when I preach that not, people don't always understand what I'm saying. And I worry about that even here because if, if you're English, maybe you're a little slower in English and you think, he talks so fast. He talks so funny. I can barely understand him. That this actually happened when I, one of the groups I sent to China, we had a, a, a guy who we call a good old country boy. And he talked like this. It's got that southern draw. Whenever you do the southern draw, pull your mouth back and say, hi, bye, why. I mean, he just, he was, it was sort of difficult for me to understand him. And here's a Chinese national like, I'm supposed to translate that? <laughs> is that English? What is that? that? No understanding. Sometimes people hear or read scripture, just like I did with when Jesus says, your eye offends you, pluck it out. And I thought to myself, how gruesome. And I misunderstood. Years later, I realized the disciples had all their eyes. Jesus probably did not mean that literally. <laughs> right? That, that's good hermeneutics. That's good reading of the scriptures in context. There's so much I misunderstood, either because of lack of knowledge or because I did not want to understand it. Hard soil. The shallow soil, the rocky, fearful of what other people's, of other people, what they will say or what they will do. As a group of teenagers, I asked them one time, what keeps you from sharing the gospel? One girl said, I don't want people to call me names. And that's a legitimate fear. 
especially if it's your family, if it's your friends, if it's your coworkers, if it's your boss. We are afraid. We're worried about what will happen. That's the rocky soil. The sapped soil, that's the thorny. It saps all the strength. We're invested more in stuff than Jesus. And I saw this with one of my teenagers. We were doing a retreat. She asked me, she said, or I asked her, I said, are you going on this event? She says, let me check my calendar and see if I'm doing anything else. Did you hear that sour note? Did you hear that sour note that when it comes to church, if I'm doing anything else, anything else wins? I did a, a retreat one time. Uh, Bush Gardens is a, a big fancy amusement park in America near Washington, D.C. I, I did a retreat with my teenagers. I said, we're going to go to Virginia Beach. We're going to do Bible study. We're going to go do some missions on the beach. And then we're going to go to Bush Gardens. And we're going to spend a whole day at the amusement park. Roller coasters, weird food, strange entertainment, water park, lots of fun. One of my teenagers looked at me and said, so we're going to do Bible study when we're not at the park, right? I said, yeah, we're going to do a little retreat, so maybe two, two and a half hours in the morning, and then we're going to do other activities. We're going to go you know, to the boardwalk. We're going to do all the fun things at, the, at Virginia Beach. And he's like, but we're going to do Bible study every day that we're not at Bush Gardens. And I said, yes. I was like, but it's paid for. The trip is paid for. He says, I don't want to go. I don't want to do that much Bible study. Rocked me a little bit. Seriously? Like, I look at this and I was shocked, but that's because I had not diagnosed a problem that had been there the whole time. That, that didn't just develop right then and there. He had been that way. And I'd missed it the whole time. So what do these soils look like? What I want to share with you is also, I believe in Matthew, Matthew shows us exactly what these soils look like. For example, the disciples in Matthew 16, all these verses come from Matthew. It says, they did not understand Jesus' warning about the, the leaven of the Pharisees. Jesus says, he tells the disciples, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples were hanging out with Jesus. And they said, is he saying this because we forgot to bring, bring bread? And Jesus says, listen, guys, that's the modern translation, listen up. How many people did we just feed a little while ago? 5,000. And the other time, 4,000. Do you think I'm really talking about bread? Do you think my concern is bread? And they're sitting there like, uh, maybe. They didn't get it. Heart, so they had no idea what Jesus was talking about. And it gets to the point they're actually afraid to ask him any questions anymore. Because they knew they just weren't, they weren't getting it. And Peter as well, Jesus predicts his death and resurrection. What does Peter do? He takes him aside and he rebukes him. No, Lord, not you. And then Jesus, he says, oh, no, no, Peter, you've got it wrong. Oh, oh, bless you, brother Peter. What, what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. He calls him that. He says that because Peter was doing the same kind of things Satan is doing, thwarting the mission of God and that's not what Peter was thinking. Peter didn't understand. Jesus had to get his attention. Also, Matthew shows us what the rocky soil looks like. The disciples, again, as a group, Jesus predicts his death and resurrections. And it says, <clears throat> the scripture says the disciples were greatly distressed. Jesus has been talking about this for a while. Jesus has been telling them what he's got to do. The Old Testament scriptures said about all this, and here Jesus is saying, hey guys, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, but I'm going to be resurrected. And all they're sitting there thinking is, oh my. You know what they're thinking. They're thinking, what's going to happen to me? Peter, when he was trying to walk on water. We often talk about Peter walking on water. I, I, I say Peter's sinking in water is what happened. Because Peter looks, he gets out of the boat, he's like, woohoo. <clears throat> but then he, what does he see? He sees the waves. So the disciples, they're afraid of what's going to happen to them from the people. Peter's thing <clears throat> is he focused on the waves rather on Jesus. And I just have to think, you know, it's one thing to look at the waves and be afraid to get out of the boat. That's one thing. But Peter's already on the water. He's already doing what he's not supposed to be doing. You're not supposed to walk on water. And he's, he's on the water. And he sees Jesus. He's like, woohoo. 
And then he looks over and he's like, big wave. Oh my. <laughs> As if they weren't there before. Like I just have to, I just have to wonder, you know, what changed <laughs> that made Peter take his eyes off? He began to focus not on Jesus, but on his circumstances. He begins to sink. He cries out, Lord, save me. But also Peter, when he denies Jesus three times, and Jesus even warned him just hours prior, he says, Peter, you're going to deny me. Peter says, no, not going to happen. No. And just, just hours later, Peter denies because he's around the fire, <clears throat> he's warm, but he's there basically with the enemies, with Romans and the slave girl, and when they confront him, weren't you with Jesus? Because Peter knows that guilt by association. And this is why in China, those Christians, and this is why you pray for the Christians in China. In China, the prison system, if the family does not pay money, then the people in prison don't eat. They die. And the Christians in prison, the problem they have is that anyone who supports them gets tagged as potentially Christian, and the government comes after you. So these, the concerns of Peter are alive and well today that Christians face these decisions. They have to face these things today. The thorny soil. Again, the disciples. There's all kinds of other examples, but I like focusing on the disciples because sometimes it makes me feel good about my own faults because I realize I'm not alone. The disciples, thorny disciples, wanting to be the greatest in the kingdom. They have that conversation. Who's the great? Jesus, who's the best? Who's going to be the best in the kingdom? Or maybe even James and John, when they go and they get their mom to go after Jesus. And uh, so, you know, and I try to culturally appropriate, call their mom. Do you say mom or mom here? Mom? Okay, good enough. So they ask Jesus, they send the mom after for, they send the mother in to ask Jesus for favors. And a lot of us don't realize that we, we look at this, this picture and we think, well, that was awfully forward of them. But remember, James and John were called out of their family business. James and John were called away from their father's boat. So the mother going and asking this question is based upon an idea that the mom is asking Jesus to pay back what she's lost. They lost labor. They lost workforce. The children were often the retirement plan. There was a lot behind that mother's request, but it was focused on stuff. Can my boys sit at your right hand and your left while all the other disciples are watching? Thorny soil. And even Peter, when he comes and he says, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Seven? Obviously, Peter's, there's, there's something, something spark that. This is that, that Peter, Peter's interested. He, he's not really asking about forgiveness. He's asking when it's okay to condemn the person. The question was not about forgiveness. Hear sometimes what they're not saying. But then the good soil, the Canaanite woman who came. She said, my daughter is possessed by a demon. And Jesus says, I've come to the lost sheep of Israel. She says, but my daughter really needs it. Jesus says, you know, does the master give the good things supposed to give to his children to dogs? She says, even dogs can eat the crumbs. And Jesus says, wow, not seen that kind of faith around here. Done. Good soil that continued to pursue because she, she knew her only source of hope. Mary, as she comes, anointing Jesus with costly perfume. And even Peter, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus says, well done. And I look at these four soils, and you know what, you know what stood out to me about the whole, all the examples? Peter is in every single one. Peter displays all four soils in the rest of the Gospel of Matthew. And I look at that and I realize that sometimes in the church, the church is a mixed bag, but each person, we've got different soils. We manifest those differently. For, for Peter to say, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, and Jesus says, well done. Well, that, that other side was then Jesus begins talking about the crucifixion, the resurrection. Peter says, no, may it not be. So right there in the same episode, Peter demonstrates great soil, 
and hard soil at the same time. And this is why in our own lives, we have to look for that. We have to till that soil to make good soil, which is what Jesus did with them. And he patiently tilled that soil. Sometimes, you know, he, he lets his righteous anger out. And he's like, how, how much longer shall I, shall I, you know, how much longer do I have to deal with you guys? He's like, are you, are you so blind? Jesus patiently tilled that soil in their hearts and minds. And from that bag of mixed soils that the disciples were, every one of you here is in this room because of them. Every one of you. Because it was from the disciples and the apostles who got the word out that had they not, you would not be here today. So I look at that, and I look at what Jesus can do with such a bag of mixed soil. And it gives me hope because I know it's not about me. It's what Jesus can do through me when I allow the gospel to take root and grow in my life. <clears throat> Believers today, again, we possess these soils. Discipleship, tilling the soil so that the Holy Spirit conforms the believer to the image of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that brings salvation, and I believe it's the Holy Spirit that brings the sanctification. The mistake we make is we grab that sanctification and make that the job of the church. And I tell you, it's the job of the Holy Spirit. The church is just the conduit. The church is just the vehicle, the road by which we help the Holy Spirit. Not that he needs our help, but we are able to do the things God has called us to do. And God uses us as the tools to make that happen. And praise God, he desires to use such bad soils as us so often. And that's why... We remember the sanctification is not about us. It's about the work of the Holy Spirit. And I think when the church makes it about us, we get what we, what we go for. We get what we plant. If we plant with the seeds of the power of man, we get a fruit that is only can come from man. But when we plant with the gospel and now the Holy Spirit to work, you see a fruit that amazes. You see, it's the kind of fruit, and I, I lived in a farming community and I asked them about, that's why I learned a lot about Jesus' illustrations, because I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, the land of Elvis. I tell people, I'm from an asphalt jungle. We used to take field trips so I could see what a cow looked like, because I had no idea. So Jesus' illustrations, I'm not lying, Jesus' illustrations, they often didn't make sense to me. I didn't get them. These are farming illustrations. I just know from farming what I see on TV. And they tell me that the whole idea, even 30 times what was sown, I mean, that's still a bumper crop. That's still amazing. And sometimes we limit it. We think, oh, you know, I hope I'm not the 30. But praise God when we produce that kind of crop, that kind of fruit, because it's not you doing it. That comes from the Holy Spirit. So how do we cultivate better soil in the lives of our believing friends? How do we do this? I've given you four roles to think about. But what I want to give you now is this idea that cultivating good soil in our culture, cultivating good soil in our churches, in our families, in our disciples, is allowing others to surface the truth for themselves by asking them probing or thought-provoking questions. This is what David Geisler goes around the world teaching and sharing, is that sometimes we focus on, you know, do this, do this, like with my children. How do I get my children to be the kind of young men that they're supposed to be? One way I can do it is I can say, guys, this is what you're going to do. You're going to clean your room. You're going to do this. You're going to do your homework. You're going to do that. They might say, yes, daddy, yes, daddy. They go do it. But they are not the kind of people who want to do it. And that when I have the conversations with my son where I say, why are you doing these kinds of things? Can you tell me? He's eight. And my wife gets a little frustrated. Just tell him to do it. Just, just have him. That's her you know, act right. Just obey. I want to know. Let's, let's talk about it. Why do you... We did this with guitar. Back in the days, there was much, much weeping and gnashing of teeth over this. My son loved going to guitar lessons. My son hated guitar practice. So five days a week, we get to struggle, tears, crying, and that's just me. But all of this, 
And then when it's time on Friday to go to lessons, he gets his guitar, and it's, he's like, I'm ready to go, Daddy. And I was like, we still got 30 minutes. What are you doing? I'm ready to go, Daddy. He goes off to guitar practice, with, or he goes to the lessons. He comes back. Oh, I did this. It was so much fun. And Monday morning, now you get to practice it. And my son says, no, Daddy, I don't want to. Please don't make me. You don't want to go to guitar lessons. I do. I do want to go to guitar lessons i got to figure out what's happening. There was a complete disconnect in his mind between the practice and the lessons. And eventually we were able to talk that out and illuminate, show those things. And this, to this day, he gets up in the morning. He gets up before we do. I, I don't know what side of the family he gets that from. But he gets up before we do, and he has this little checklist that he does in the morning. He's very structured, and one of those is practice guitar. And he goes in there, gets his guitar, practice it, and he, and he does it all on his own. Now, that's just practicing a musical instrument. I maintain that in this life, we are practicing life because sometimes we don't get it right, and sometimes we're pretty bad at it. We are practicing righteousness. We are practicing the godly life because we fail, we mess up. But do we have the kind of hearts that look at our Heavenly Father and say, no, Daddy, we don't want to do that. Don't make me go to that cell group. Don't make me go hear that weird American preacher. Don't make me go do these things. Or do we have the kind of heart that says, this is what I am and this is what I do and I'm glad it comes from that place. Having those conversations, just conversations with my son, bridge that gap with guitar practice. Can we have the kind of conversations that bridge that gap with a sanctified, Christ-like life with those, who, those whom we disciple? So when it comes to discipleship, to be truly effective, we remember the four R's. So I told you four roles we play, but where it comes down to in the lives of what we're trying to cultivate, and I tell people in your own life, there's four things you're going to need. Those four R's is we want to be rooted, rested, ready, and then reaching in Christ. This is what David Geisler, again, he came up with this to kind of summarize how can we make it simple? How can we bring kind of a foundation? What is it that we need that if we don't have, we're lacking? We've got to be rooted, rested, ready, and then we're reaching. And the mistake we make so often is we try to be reaching, but we're not rooted in Christ. Or we try to be reaching, and we're not ready. We try to be reaching, but we're not rested in Christ. And that whole idea of rest is so hard because if you're a go-getter, you want to get it done. It's all up to you. Maybe maybe in your family, you're that person that if you don't do it, it doesn't get done. I see smiles. I've identified a few. (laughs) Everyone in the family knows who they are, so there's no no secret. If I don't do it, it's not going to get done. Got to do it. Got to make it happen. And we don't know how to rest in that relationship with Christ. So here's what it looks like. What it meant, when we talk about being rooted, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides remains in me and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I asked my church, apart from Christ, can you teach Sunday school? And they get confused. They say, no. I was like, you can. Any atheist could teach a Sunday school. Jesus is talking about something else here. Because there's a lot of things that are within our power to do. But when it's only within our power, that's all, we, that's all we're going to get is the temporary, the superficial. So when he says, apart from me, you can do nothing, it's a nothing of significance that will last. It's nothing that goes for the kingdom that will last and continue on. We must remain. We must be rooted in Christ. Hit too many buttons. Then we must be rested in Christ. Jesus tells us, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we look at the idea of restedness, and we see this idea of yoke, and we say these things, yes, I want rest. What does that look like? What does this really look like in our lives? How do we rest? And 
One of the things I've often uh, done with my church and my discipleship group, I did this at my Bible college. I share this truth with them, and it's a, and it's a little radical for, for some people. But coming from the book of Romans, in three, Romans 3.21, Jesus says this, and you get it right. Now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So I ask people, the righteousness of God, what's he, what is Paul talking about? And they, they give some different answers. We do this conversationally. <clears throat> and I said, I said, who's bearing that righteousness? They said, Jesus. I said, that's not what the text says. Read it again. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested, revealed, apart from the law, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I said the righteousness of God has been revealed in the lives of the believers. That's what it says, right? Because we're the ones who are having faith in Jesus. Apart from the law, the righteousness is revealed. So I asked my, my congregation, my friends, my students, I said, if Jesus' righteousness is here, where is your righteousness? Now, in one sense, our righteousness, people say, is down here. But according to Romans 3.21, there's a sense the righteousness of Christ has been revealed by faith in all those who believe. This is sometimes difficult for people. Because Paul is telling us that righteousness, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, that's the basis on which we're saved. You can't be saved on your righteousness because you don't measure up. But the righteousness of Christ has been given to us. And so we read that it's manifested. There's one sense where, as we're saved, we have that righteousness of Christ. Now, our actual behavior, we're trying to make that match. And so the restedness comes from the fact that we are rested from our labors. We don't have to work for our salvation. Jesus paid it all. And that when we put faith in the gospel then we have that salvation. And we can work from a place of restedness. We're not excused from behaviors any more than when I married my wife. You know, when you're dating, you court and you date and you get the flowers and you do all the wonderful stuff. And then when you're married, you just get to do whatever you want to then, right? I saw more women heads move <laughs> than men heads. I'd like you to know that. No! No! Now, I, I went to the altar. I remember when I was married 18 years ago, I stood there. I was, I was, and true story, I was the crying mess. I just broke down on stage. I could barely say my vows. My wife had already had her cry fest, so she was very stoic. I was like, thanks, dear. You know, I'm all alone up there, just babbling. And I, and I remember, I remember telling her, I love you. But what happened after we were married, I grew in that love that I recognized my, my vows had nothing about doing the dishes. I said that once, just once, never say it again. My vows have nothing to do with, do with doing the dishes. I didn't marry so I could do dishes. I didn't marry so I could do someone else's laundry. I didn't marry so that I could spend time watching girly movies, chick flicks, like the kind of love stories that my wife likes. She loves like dramatic, like movies, and I like things that blow up and monsters. So we have, we have a difficulty. I, I didn't marry for that. Like, how, how does that come with it? It comes from the love for my wife, my union with my wife, and that by not doing the dishes or by doing the dishes, I'm not any more or less married, but because I'm united with her from that love, again, I serve and I manifest from that. That's what it means to be rested. I don't have to work to maintain my marriage as far as staying legally married. I don't have to work to be more married. And when I behave myself as a husband, I'm not more married or more husbandry, husbandly, I guess. What happens, though, is that from that position of rest, as my wife's husband, as my wife's best friend, I operate from that and I'm rested to just love and enjoy and experience and to grow in that relationship with her. We do this in human relationships. How much more with our Heavenly Father 
who reached out and he says, I paid the price through my son. Rest in me and get going. When we understand that as disciples, it changes everything. Because that's on the basis in which we get ready. And your hearts honor Christ as Lord is holy, holy. Always being ready, always being prepared to make a defense for anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And then we are reaching. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. And what I tell the church is I said the church has dimmed its light. The church, in some cases, has putrefied. Big English word. We've, we've become rotten in our churches. Salt prevents the rot. It preserves. The light shines. And this is why if we don't start in the church, we will not impact the culture. We will not impact the world. And so these four R's, they have to start with us. It has to be within us to become disciple makers. And if I could, I'll share with you this one last idea. Because we have four roles we play. These four R's are critical to us being the kind of disciples. And I, I learned a word when I, lived, when I worked out in the country. And so I have, I have used this phrase wherever I have gone. And you have to follow. You have to listen carefully. You can't give what you ain't got. This is good southern speak. You can't give. That's how you pronounce it. You can't give what you ain't got. You cannot pass on to your children skills you do not possess. You cannot, pa you, you cannot pass on to your children genes you don't possess. You cannot pass on to your children the image of Christ if you yourself do not have that image. We can't do it with our children. We can't do it in our church. And we surely will not do it in the world. You can't give what you ain't got. It starts with us. It starts with us as the church. Are we the kind of disciples? It was this idea I tried to press upon my students this week. Are you the kind of disciple Christ has redeemed you to be? Not one based upon external, but one whose heart has been changed, one whose heart manifests this outwardly. Are you that kind? And I, I challenge you this morning in church, that as we come to this time of worship and reflection, I challenge you, are you that kind? Are you rooted in Christ? Is your soul rested in Christ? Because if it's not, you will never be ready. Are you being made ready? Are you, be given, are you, are you receiving the skills? I was listening to, at, at the, the last campus, the different things the church has going on, and those are, those are wonderful. I am not in any way saying, oh, the external is wrong. We need those skills. We need to know what to do. When I went off to college, I didn't even know how to cook soup. And I literally ruined my first meal of soup because I didn't know. I didn't know how. No one showed me. No one showed me how to check the oil in my car. My wife had to show me. No one showed me. When we got a flat tire, I knew how to change the flat tire because I took a speech class in college and someone did as their speech on how to do things, how to change a flat tire. And I remembered from 10 years prior how to change a flat tire because I accidentally learned how. Are we ministering and moving as disciples in the church by accident or as a manifestation of the change that God has brought in our hearts? My challenge to you this morning in this church, what's your soil like? Do you need Jesus and the Holy Spirit to come in and till some of that soil? It's never too late. 
then you are never so far gone and you are not so stubborn that the Holy Spirit can't come in and break up whatever has taken root in your heart, whatever is there. Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, he can make it happen. And then we will be the church in here, South Africa, to hear the news of the way that God moves and changes. It doesn't happen through large crowds. It really doesn't. It doesn't happen from some Yahoo on the stage. It happens from you. You there in the pew, each one of you, you are the city on the hill. You are that light of Christ. You are the salt of the earth. That's how your communities, your family, South Africa, and the world will be changed. It's you. And if you're sitting there right there and you keep saying, no, 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 let the Holy Spirit work in your life this morning. Because if he redeemed you, he can redeem others through your witness, being the disciple God has redeemed you to be. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. Father, we, we fall at your feet knowing how far we are from the mark of Jesus Christ. We rejoice that we can call upon the Savior. We rejoice that the price was paid for us. But as your word says, we, God, let us remember we are poor in spirit. We are destitute. And from that, may we mourn. May it grieve our hearts. But Father, also, through your spirit, may we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And Father, we can go out and be the salt and the light, but first let that light shine bright in our hearts. Let that salt come from within. Change us that there would be generations to come. There will be those in the future as we look back at the apostles and say, because of them we are here, that there will be those in the future that say, because of these here who sit in the pew, we are able to praise God from a life changed because they, they were disciple makers. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.